take us to time. Congressman Kevin McCarthy, thank you so much for being here. You've had a busy week uh, back here at home, away from uh, Washington, D.C. Obviously, an issue that so many people uh, are talking about. We want to welcome in our audience uh, viewing us on Facebook right now and turn to 23.com. Affordable health care. Yes. There's been so much talked about in the political sphere, lots of rhetoric. Uh, repeal, replace. Uh, we were talking just a moment ago. There are some new developments. There's been a draft bill that's circulating uh, with some, with some uh, things that have been mentioned, uh, potential cuts to Medicaid, um, some different subsidies. Uh, talks about you were mentioning about tax credits. What, where do we stand with the repeal, replace, and, and can we expect a plan from Congress soon? Well, yes, you can. And let, let's talk about this because this is exactly what we ran on the campaign. Uh, it's a promise that I made that we would repeal Obamacare and that we would replace it. So what I have done since the election, I have been meeting with people um, to make sure that we replace it in the proper way. So th just this week I've met with Kern Systems, which has managed the most for Medicaid throughout California, um, Kern Medical, uh, Russell Judd. Uh, I've met with both children's hospitals from Fresno and Los Angeles, where our children go in that care, from San Joaquin and others. I want to make sure we uh, do this correctly. Um, and many others in this process. Obamacare is mainly two things, the network and the expansion of Medicaid. Now, if we look what is happening right now, just last week, Hamana said they're pulling out of the network. Now, that has left 16 counties in Tennessee with no provider. You have roughly 3,000 counties in America we now have one-third of them with one provider. You have premiums that have risen. Um, you have 23 co-ops that were created that were given more than $2 billion. 18 of those have collapsed. You have Aetna, who just said last week, it's on a death spiral. Um, if we did nothing, it would collapse upon itself. I don't want to see that happen because those are individuals. That's health care in America, and I can't sit back and allow that to happen. Now, the expansion of Medicaid, Medicaid was created mainly for blind, disabled, and others to care for, and the federal government said when they created that, they'd pay 50% and the state would pay the other. In the expansion of Obamacare, they went to 130% of poverty, and they did the expansion where they did 100% and they leveled that down to 95 and they'd pay 90%. In the next 10 years, that now will start to cost America $1 trillion. Now, if you put that in perspective and you look at the budget of America today, if you take just the discretionary spending of America, that means discretionary, what we spend for the military, Department of Ag, Department of Education, everything outside of Social Security, Medicare, and interest on the debt, that's about a $1 trillion. So we know we can't afford that going forward, so that will collapse on itself. So we've got to take an approach of how can we, how can we create a system for health care to care for those that need health care outside of, one, Medicare, if you have health care your, from your job already, and others, and make a system where we lower the cost and provide greater care. So we've come up with a better plan. And in this plan, what we do, you've got to have a network that actually works. So for those that can't afford it, we create a tax credit. So instead of government telling you what the plan is going to be and <clears throat> no network in there, we empower the individual. So they, if you have Medicaid, how many doctors take Medicaid? Not all. In some cases, they've said half and others. You can go through in different areas are different. Sometimes it's concerned about a specialist or others. But if you have a tax credit, you're going into the marketplace the marketplace that other people are in too, more options, more desire. Just as Judy and I, when our kids were younger, the type of health care that we desired is different than the health care we desire today, and you have greater choices. It helps control the cost, but it also puts the individual into the driver's seat to choose and care for. And then right. we have a transition period, and we put flexibility for the states so they can manage their Medicaid system better and manage the health care of the system for the state better. I believe this will save it and actually be a more healthy process. But you, you cited examples from other communities. Your district, specifically here in Kern County, there's, uh, by estimates, 100,000 people, uh, 16 to 18,000 new enrollees this year alone into the Affordable Care Act. 
uh, with, with affordable health insurance. Uh, <coughs> many more on Medi-Cal. Uh, a lot of these people say it works, and, and a lot of people are happy with their coverage. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. If you can talk about Medi-Cal and, 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 and here now, uh, make a, either a promise or a guarantee that folks Medi-Cal won't be affected or taken away. Secondly, um, just given a lot of parts that people like about Obamacare and, and the Affordable Care Act, we've seen this across the country with town halls and protests. Uh, people like the staying on your parents' insurance until you're 26, no pre-existing conditions. What are uh, can you acknowledge there are good parts of the Affordable oh, Care Act it, and, and, and it, things that you want to keep? Oh, uh, of course. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that are set out there that are not true because people want to put scare tactics. And that's why I want to be productive about this. And that's why I have spent my time talking and listening to people that want to have productivity about how to make the system right. But Congressman, we you will never repeal, and we have not repealed, pre-existing conditions, our children, keeping them on your insurance plan at 26. When we repealed it and sent it to the president, those stayed in it. And we're going to do the same now. So there's no need to be fearful of that. That's not the case. Those but, will stay. That's a promise. Right. Congressman, you talked about talking to people. You mentioned before you met with some health care leaders, Kern Medical, and, and, and some uh, other health companies here in town. One of the big things people have been asking for a town hall. They want to talk to you directly. They want to see mm -hmm. you. They want to hear from you. We've seen in districts across the country, small, large, Senate districts, congressional districts. How having, much talking has been going on in those? Right. There's been, it's been a lot of anger yeah. and a lot of, a, a lot of contention. Yeah. Uh, do you regret? How much you're, heading, you're heading home Sunday. Do you regret not holding a town hall and, and meeting with people while you've been home for, for the week? Do I regret not holding a town hall? No. I meet with a lot of people. I, I pride myself on a, the accessibility I have. If you sit back and look at the number of town hall meetings I have, the teletown halls I have, I will sit back and we will call the number of people where they can ask the questions, the number of meetings I have. I come home off every single weekend, the number of meetings. And I will continue to do that and continue to listen uh, and continue to improve in all that process. I just do not think it's productive. And if you look at what's going on, there's a reason why it's going across the country. There is a plan, and you can sit down and you can see why it's consistent in each district because it's written by a political individuals that tells you what to do, to tell you to go through, and to do the exact same thing. Now, if that same plan is to sit down and talk about these are ideas that you want to, I'm more than willing to do that. Is but, there, let, is but let's be frank about this. This is what we campaigned on that we would repeal and replace it. I'm keeping a campaign promise, and that's what we're walk, walking through on. And I will listen, and I will represent this district just as we promised to do. And if people want to have a discussion, I'm going to have a discussion about it. Right. But if people want to yell with one another and have a fight about other things, I don't think that's right. And to be fair, you did have protesters come to your home. Uh, I want to get your thoughts this on that. This is not the first time, too. Right. And you've never heard me complain about that. I think people have the right for the First Amendment. Right. I have gone, this isn't new. Ever since I've been elected into leadership, I have had protests in the office. They come into the office and they stay. They disrupt our work and our ability to help for veterans and others. They've come to my office before, they've scratched my cars, they've pounded on the windows. It got to the point where the police chief looked me in the eye and told me they couldn't send the police in because it wasn't safe for the police to come in. But I understand that's part of my job. But I also think it's the right of the individual to speak, and I think they have the right to do that. And I want them to have the right to do that. Um, Can we look forward to a some kind of public forum where uh, I always have public forum. but some kind of public meeting where media is allowed where individuals they can come. always can I'm okay. sitting here right there with you right uh, the criticism has come this week though congressman that there's been several events around town uh, where you've been speaking to either donors or individuals of nonprofits uh, but again there was no so town we hall where we want to criticize that I that I spent one year to get Condi Rice to come to raise the money for the summer programs the Boys and Girls Club. Certainly so, the criticism so the isn't... Are, no, no, certainly don't, the, don't let's be honest what the criticism is. Right. Because that is what this group is using. Now, I'm proud of the fact that the Bakersfield has the largest Boys and Girls Club in the nation. And I see the change that they make in these young lives across this community. And when they came to me a year ago to ask if I could get Condi Rice to come and raise the money, and we planned for a year to do it, yes, I said I would do it. And we planned. And that's what Bakersfield does, that we help one another, right. some that don't have the money to do it. 
well, you know what? Young kids are going to be able to go after school programs because we did that. Now, if a political operation wants to put another meeting together and think I should cancel that so some kids can't go after school to that program, I'm going to make the decision for the kids, not so they can make some political notion on something else. Well, we'll move on here. Um, there's been, uh, we've talked several times, and uh, we've seen you on the national front. Um, the president is going to make his first uh, address to the Joint Congress on Tuesday. Yes. Um, it, there's been reports that the president has confided in you, trusted you, and spoken to you on several issues. Uh, how is your relationship with the president, and specifically to Kern County? Obviously, this is uh, a majority liberal state, democratic state. Uh, you are, in, in a sense, the, the conduit uh, to the Republican agenda for the state of California. Do you feel a sense of responsibility? How does Kern County fit into that in terms of uh, housing, uh, projects we have going on here, new, new construction, uh, law enforcement? I know uh, uh, Sheriff Donnie Youngblood was back in, in D.C. recently meeting with some of the administration. Do you see yourself as, as the spokesperson, so to speak, for uh, the California and Republican agenda here? And no, I see first and foremost my responsibility is the 23rd Congressional District. Those are the individuals who elect me. That's who I represent, and that's what I'm always going to represent. And I'm always going to make sure I put those values first and at the table. And I'm going to work hard to make sure they're there. And I, I've worked hard to build a relationship, no matter who's president, but I've built a relationship with our current president as well. Um, I want to make sure he knew our issues when it came to water. We were fortunate that before the last Congress that I could work an agreement out with Senator Dianne Feinstein. It was the first time in 25 years we were actually passed the first big mm -hmm. legislation when it came to water. So we didn't lose all this water out to the ocean. We were able to capture some more than we had been able to capture before. I'm concerned, though, with what's happening in Sacramento with Kevin DeLeon and the Speaker hiring Eric Holder, the former Attorney General. Um, and I had this discussion with the Governor. I know the New York Times wrote a story, but I think they got it actually reversed. My discussion with the Governor was, with a new president coming in, and even before he was sworn in, they're hiring the former attorney general thinking how they can fight this new president, instead of saying how can we sit down and how can we work together for the benefit of all California. It doesn't mean you agree with him, but let's find the places we can find common ground. When I look at the dam breaking, when I look at the infrastructure, knowing that we're going to have an infrastructure bill, I want to make sure all Californians have a fair shake. And that's why I try to get together, where I could bring people together of all California. Can we expect some of these water projects to get going? I know with your, with your uh, farm bill, there was some promise of infrastructure investment, but a lot of that's been, been stalled uh, because you mentioned issues in Sacramento, and a lot of these projects haven't started. But here we are with record rain. Uh, we saw that in Oroville, and we've seen it all across Northern California, where a lot of this rainfall is happening. Any promise for uh, federal assistance, further uh, legislation, or further... Uh, lobbying to get some of this, these projects uh, well, you know, our, our, our bill was just signed at the end of last year, and we've already seen benefits for it. Because it, it had the direct result was the ability to pump more. So you've seen water come down. Now, the projects are going to take a little time as we go. But uh, you're going to see new placement of people in with the new administration, and you'll see a return on that investment of that new, um, the new legislation going forward. What's the mood like in Washington? I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Um, obviously, this is one of the most contentious political times we've ever seen uh, from both the left and right. Uh, you are in a unique position as the second ranking Republican in this country. Uh, you speak directly at times uh, and have the ear, as we mentioned, of the president. Uh, what, what's going on there? And, and you know, there's, there's since I, I talk with people and I've, I've spoken with them about health care. Uh, we have reporters on, on daily talking to immigration concerns here at home. Um, is there, is there hope that things will get better uh, in this country and, and specifically in our county? You know, one of the highest unemployment rates still in the state. Uh, we have immigration concerns. Uh, we just had Arvin who was talking about becoming a sanctuary city, a contentious debate there. Uh, are you hopeful for what we see here in, in Kern County and, and across the nation? Um, yeah, I'm very hopeful. I, I firmly believe the best days are in front of us. Um, I know this is the very best country to be in. I think the rest of the world, there is chaos going on. There are challenges of uh, can we make the right decision. I think the country is divided. Um, but I think this is a moment to show real leadership. This is the moment not to make political gains with one another. This is a moment for calmness. Not to yell with one another, but to find that common ground. Not to spike the football, because one side won and the other not. We, ha we have a government 
that is devised to find compromise. And that's what I want to see. I want to see everyone at the table. I welcome anyone to come and bring their idea because they are welcome to give it. And I will find a place that we can work together and make sure we solve these problems. And, and on that last topic, and I'll, I'll ask one more time, uh, and just to leave with our audience here watching and, and, and to, to, talk, to think about the future, is there any uh, plans, any, anything that you have on your schedule that you can share with folks in terms of a public forum where people can air ideas, can, like you mentioned? I always have public forums. There will be public forums in the future. Right. I think right now the climate, and there's different, there's different ways to have public forums. Like right now we're sitting doing an interview for television, but we're doing it live on Facebook. People get their news different. If I do a public forum, especially since I became in leadership, and when you watch some of these protests, there are a lot of people that aren't the constituents. So it drowns out people who are part of Kern County for getting their message out, or they overtake over one issue instead of the other. But if I do a teletown hall, people never have to leave their home. They don't get an act where someone gets to speak somebody else down, but they get to say directly what they want to, and everybody else gets to hear and they all get to hear the answer. And sometimes when they're even in their own home, they don't get shy about what they're going to say to me. They can even be a little tougher. And they can do it from their own home where somebody doesn't have the ability to go out. And you go and look at anyone. There's probably, I've done more than almost anybody in Congress. And I'll continue to do that. I want to be accessible. But I'll not only just do those, you'll see me out in the community. You'll see me, you'll hear me on the radio. You'll see me on the news. I pride myself. I feel honored that individuals will allow me to represent them. And I want to do the very best job that I can. You mentioned Facebook. Uh, perhaps are you open uh, to a Facebook type, uh, type form? I've been to those teleforms you're talking about. Yeah. Are you open to that in the future? I mean, I, I think that'd be a good... I think uh, we should work together. There are going to be a lot of issues going forward. I, any other, any ways that I could find that I can continue to listen. Look, I've always prided myself on to have the wisdom to listen with the courage to lead. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to do, I'm going to do just because someone's going to shout at me. The real courage is to make sure that we make the right decision. I will listen, but what's interesting to me is that a political operation gives somebody a playbook to walk in and yell at somebody to try to intimidate them. If I was going to get in this job because I was going to let somebody intimidate me, I wouldn't run for this job. I ran for this job and I promised people that I would repeal Obamacare because it has failed and I would replace it. And the people voted and they knowingly knew that that's what I would do and that is what I'm going to follow through and do. I'm going to keep my promise to the people of the 23rd district that I said I would do it. And I'm working with individuals right now to make sure that we do it correctly. House Majority Leader, Congressman Kevin McCarthy, 23rd District, Bakersfield. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you.